Okay. Thanks for joining us on episode two of Randall Reports. We're going to continue talking about the Torrid Complex Smoking Gun paper that came out, actually published in uh, the November 2021 journal, Planetary and Space Science. So this is brand new, fresh material that we got a early peek at and uh, really pertinent information here for the Halloween season and uh, also getting people interested in wanting to go out and watch meteor showers. We got the Leonids coming up in the next couple of days. Also next week, uh, one of the most active showers of the year. So hopefully it'll stir some interest, get people looking outside at the, the night sky. So, uh, good to have you with me here again, Randall. We got, uh, not Randall and Russ, but we'll do Randall and rad here on Randall, Randall reports. We're going to stick with the RR. Well, I like that. It has a certain ring to it, Randall and Rad, because, you know, back in, in the day, you know, the term Rad meant kind of, you know, really cool. You know, if you were Rad, man, you were you were with it. You were hip. You were... Radical. Uh, radical. There was a... Yeah, man. There was an Atlanta radio co-host that was Radical Bradford. Oh, I okay. That. Yeah, first, so, time I ever, first time I ever saw Rad, I was like 11, and I had got a s- skateboard... And uh, when those just came out, late 70s, right, and uh, went to some sports shop and the guy signed it, get rad. And I had no idea what that was, get rad. But apparently that was the cool California term at that point for skateboarding. Now we're talking 1980s here. Yeah, late 70s, early 80s, right around then. Yeah, that that, that, that that was the days of rad. So I guess he's gone now, so... You can kind of move up into the uh, next level of the hierarchy and you can become Radical Bradley or Rad Brad. Well, I seems, think I've seems, been living that out, but I think there's probably a new level to, we can go to. Mm-hmm. There's always new levels we can go to. So, yeah, Torrid Meteor Smoking Gun. Hey, and talking about levels, man, we got some levels. Lunar, solar, planetary, stellar, galactic. Yeah. So... Torrid meteor shower. What's the deal anyway with the torrid meteor shower? Well, I'm going to go right now. We'll go since we're uh, going to keep this thing succinct. Um, I'm going to go right to the introduction of this new paper that came out, uh, published in Planetary and Space Science, came out in November of 21. Uh, but we had access to the preprint thanks to George Howard um, actually a month or two ago. So that's the general routine now is – uh, these papers get published online before they see the print journal. But uh, it starts right out in the introduction uh, by referring back to Fred Whipple, who was one of the great founders of, of cometary science, who did some of the early and important studies on the torrid meteor stream. Now, just for, I think a lot of the listeners already know, but for those who don't, the torrid meteor stream um, is a stream that Uh, And we'll show a a, a graphic shortly here to help people visualize it. But um, it's a stream that the Earth crosses twice each year. Um, And we have the summertime torrids and the the autumn torrids. The summertime torrids peak in late June, early July. And the Earth crosses through the stream. And then it goes around the sun. And as it comes back around, it crosses the stream again. Um, And this is... uh, the uh, Halloween torrents because it peaks uh, late October, early November. And I'm just going to go right here to the introduction of the paper. And it says here that the according to Whipple, now this is Fred Whipple, uh, in 1967, in the original proposal, let's see, I'm going to jump down here for a second. And this paper in 1967 uh, was a NASA Special publication 150, the zodiacal light in the interplanetary medium. So undoubtedly what he's talking that's reflecting off of a stream of dust. And that stream of dust is now attributed to uh, being part of the torrid meteor stream. So I'll go back now to uh, the introduction. According to Whipple, in his 1967 original proposal, the unusual and odd comet 2P forward slash Anki, here and after simply 2P, is the main source of a complex system 
of massive meteor showers collectively called torrids, and also the main contributor to the zodiacal cloud. Based on this association between 2P and all these showers, Klub and Napier, that's Victor Klub and, and Bill Napier in 1984, developed the torrid complex giant comet hypothesis. This hypothesis proposes that a giant comet of approximately 100 kilometers in diameter, which is about 60 miles, comparable to that of a typical Kuiper belt object, fragmented 10 to 20,000 years ago, producing a complex of dust, meteor streams, and relatively large bodies, including 2P, uh, and also concluded, now get this, the Tunguska event of June 30th, 1908. All were related to a member, was, was related to a member of this group. Um, in the literature, the propose, in the date proposed for the cataclysmic event that gave origin to the torrid complex is approximately constrained by dynamic considerations. It varies between 20,000 and 30,000 years before present, depending on which dynamic model is used. Um, so that gives you a little bit of background. Uh, he goes on to say, let me add this, much more than that, and now the torrid complex would have already been dispersed, having completely lost um, current or partial, current partial compactness. You see, in other words, you've got a big object and it starts to fragment. So there's initially going to be a concentrated cluster of objects. But as this cluster is moving around the sun, it becomes dispersed. And eventually, it's dispersed almost uniformly around the entire stream. Okay. Uh, if, he goes on to be unclear in this, um, if the, uh, the arrival of this giant comet in the inner solar system was much older, older than 20 to 30,000 years ago, just to reiterate this, um, it would have been already dispersed having completely lost the current partial, partial compactness, and much less than 20,000 years ago, the torrid complex would be much more compact than present. So that is one indication of the, the age of a meteor stream. You know, how, right. how diffuse and how dispersed is the material in it? Um, now, this is, this is where really, I, to me, this gets really interesting. And going back to, uh, he's going to reference Klub and Napier again in 1984. And the specific reference that he's uh, invoking there is uh, the microstructure of terrestrial catastrophism published in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. Um, so anyways, in that According to Klub and Napier in 1984, the most recent glaciation on Earth, which began around 22,000 years before present, and it actually, a lot of studies I've seen puts it a little bit older than that, uh, 24 to 26,000. But it depends, again, on which model and which study and which set of dates are being used. But it's right in that window, okay? They're giving the date here, 22,000. Now, I'll, I'll kind of segue a little bit and say that, you know, there was a shift from the so-called interstadial period prior to this, where the climate was generally much warmer, and then it sh the climate shifted. Now, how you would uh, date that, it, you know, it depends on how you date that. Now, suppose you look at the growth of the ice sheet, and you go, okay, well, there was significant ice at 22,000 years ago. So we'll put that as the beginning of this date of the last phase of the Wisconsin Ice Age. However, maybe that ice mass that's that's showing up in the record is not really when the climate shifted from a warmer climate to a cold climate. That might have been two or three or 4,000 years earlier. You see my point. In other words, there's a range of things that you can use to, to establish the dates. 
and I don't know, he's, they're not giving uh, the sp source of, of the specifics how they came up with this date, but it, it puts us in the window, right? Okay. I'm just iterating that I have seen other studies that would suggest it's a little more like 24, 25,000 years ago, but it's not that critical. But the most recent glaciation on Earth, which began around 22,000 years before present, was closely related to the supposed catastrophic event due to the influx of cosmic material produced by the fragmentation. Now, this is getting into some of the stuff that I think is, is critically important and extremely interesting, is that they are invoking the idea of an exogenic trigger for something that's happening down here on the Earth. Exogenic simply means that it's from outside the Earth, right? As opposed, let's say, to endogenic, meaning from within or you know, generated from within. In this case, it would be something uh, generated from within the Earth. Let's say a volcanic eruption could be considered endogenic because it's originating within the Earth. A meteor shower, an asteroid impact, a, co a fragmented comet or whatever could be considered exogenic because it's outside the Earth. Now, another really important and interesting field of study is the connection between those. I mean, there's some evidence emerging that would suggest that episodes of uh, heightened volcanic activity are directly related to episodes of heightened uh, bombardment from things from space. And, well, that could probably make sense, you know, because, uh, you know, if you've got a mile-wide asteroid traveling at 10 or 20 times the speed of a, of a high-powered rifle bullet, and it strikes the earth, I mean, that kinetic punch is going to have extraordinary consequences for everything on the earth. Absolutely. Let Abs me put in some perspective there. I've got my role as scale man, so I'm trying to always give a perspective of uh, the size of things, right, that we're looking Please, at. So, yeah. so, so Comet Anki, which they're referring to, you know, just alphanumeric as 2P, is like three miles across, correct? So yeah, that's, that's something that we're able to track it. It's still outgassing so we can see it when it's, uh, coming around the sun and we, we know its path, uh, pretty well. So that's half is the diameter of the, the dinosaur killer. So you were just referring to a one mile object that was six mile object. So Enki is three miles. That would be, you know, Ooh. planetary devastation. It would be right? planetary devastation. No doubt. It right, would not be as serious as the Cretaceous tertiary dinosaur killer, but yeah, it would basically wipe out human civilization. It, right. I think so, human humans would survive, but we would definitely be thrown right back to a stone age existence. And, and this is probably a whole episode in in itself, but, oh, but yeah. just to, just to, you know, to say that that's, that one is the largest one we know of. Is that correct? Because it is outgassing and we can follow it, but there could be totally black, dark ones that are even larger that are yes. in that stream yes. is, is the really important thing that, that eventually we need to get to. So, Yes. And, of course, I mean, he referenced the Tunguska event because that actually uh, was the, the right time of year. It emanated right from the proper region of space. Uh, so both of those important criteria are consistent with it being a torrid uh, meteor that the Earth encountered on June 30th, uh, 1908. But there are probably thousands of objects in that Tunguska range, which you could think of as being now, you know, when uh, volume scales by the cube of the radius. So that means that, you know, 500 foot object would, wouldn't be a planet killer, but it could be a continent killer. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, uh, enjoyed it, my friend.